Hey everyone, welcome to Happy Plate. I'm Jewel. I have a very interesting unsolved mystery to tell you today. I'm gonna share with you the story of the Moore family and the Axe Murder House. There were eight people total who were brutally murdered in their sleep in the middle of the night. No one heard anything, no one saw anything, and to this day, nobody knows who did it. But we'll go over some potential suspects and I will paint a picture as to exactly how the murder scene looked. So stay tuned, it's very interesting. We'll also talk about the Axe Murder House today. So for our meal today, we're gonna keep it really healthy because I'm going on vacation soon, but we are eating Mediterranean salads with pita bread on the side. So let's um, do first bites together and then I will tell you this gruesome story of the Moore family and the Axe Murder House. Okay, let's do first bites of our Mediterranean salad. I'm try not to stab and be annoying. <laughs> Mmm. Salads can be yummy too. This is really good. So I think I've eaten enough to let me get through the first part of the story. We are gonna go back to the evening of June 9th, 1912. So this is an old story. Josiah and Sarah Moore and their four children, they left their home to go to their local church for a children's event. It started at about eight o'clock. And then when the night was over, the daughter of the Moore family asked if her two friends, um, Ina and Lena Stillinger could stay the night. The Stillinger girls were also at the church for that event that night. And so when it was all over, the eight of them walked back to the Moore residence at about nine o'clock, 9.30 at night. So they get back, they all sort of settle in and everyone goes to bed, probably around 10 o'clock that night. So the next morning, the neighbor, Mary Peckham, she was outside at about 5 a.m. She was starting her, like, her household chores and she was outside for a couple hours and realized there was like nothing going on over at the Moore house. There were no lights in the windows that she could see. There was no movement, no sounds. And this is like a family with four young children. So usually, you know, it's, it's pretty active. They actually had like horses and chickens and animals and stuff. So they would normally be up and out and about pretty early. So this was very strange. After a couple hours, Mary Peckham thought, you know what, this is really weird. She had a very bad feeling in her stomach, so she decides to go over and knock on the door and just talk to them. So she knocks on the door and there's no answer. She knocks again, totally silent. She can't even hear movement coming from like inside the house. So then she decides to try the doorknob. She actually like wiggles the doorknob and it's locked from the inside. So she goes back to her house and she just still has this feeling in her stomach like something is off. So she calls Ross Moore, who is Josiah's brother. And she's like, listen, nobody has been moving. There's no lights. I can't see anything through the windows. I don't know what's going on. Why don't you give him a call, you know? He had no idea what they were doing either. He hasn't spoken to them. So eventually he ends up driving to the Moore residence, goes up to the door. Mary Peckham was outside. She goes over. So the two of them knock on the door. Again, no answer. So they go around to the side to the window. They start banging on the window and they're yelling for Josiah to come let them in. Still nothing. So Ross pulls out his big, he had like a big thing of keys and he starts fishing through and he finds the key that goes to Josiah's home. He uses the key and he walks into the house and it's quiet, like eerily quiet. So he walks through the living room and there's a bedroom downstairs off of the living room and he opens the door and he walks in he immediately sees two bloody bodies that have been brutally murdered and just blood everywhere so he runs back through the living room and out onto the porch and he orders mrs peckham to call the sheriff and he was just mortified so he didn't even go through the rest of the home 
So after a couple hours, it took a while before the coroner, the sheriff showed up, and there were even, they say up to a hundred people from the town, because this is a small town in, in uh, Villisca, Iowa, you know, like, it's quiet, nothing ever happens in this town, so a huge crowd gathered. The coroner showed up, and they ended up going through the rest of the home where they found Josiah and Sarah in their bedroom, both dead in their bed. And then they found the four more children in the upstairs bedroom, also bl brutally murdered and covered in blood. And then the two girls that Ross Moore discovered in the downstairs bedroom was actually the Stillinger sisters, which were the neighbor's friends that stayed over, which is so sad. What's so hard about such a horrible, brutal murder um, like this back then is like, they didn't have DNA testing. Yeah and they had fingerprinting, but it was like so new. Yeah. But, so they did a total inspection of the whole home, all of the rooms and everything. And here is what we actually know about the crime scene. You ready? Mm. So there, eight, there were eight people total that were murdered. The two parents, the four children, and the two Stillinger friends that stayed the night. All eight of them were murdered in the same way. They were all bludgeoned to death with an ax to the skull. All eight of them had cloth or clothing covering their face after they were murdered. And the coroner said that they were all sleeping when it happened. The axe, which was the murder weapon, actually belonged to Josiah. Mm -hmm. And it was found in the downstairs bedroom on the floor next to the bodies of um, Ina and Lena Stillinger that were, they were in the bed, but it was found like on the floor near them. Mm -hmm. And then in each room, there was, you know, like the old kerosene lamps? Right. Yeah. Each room had one of those lamps with like the chimney part removed off of it on the floor, but the top part removed, which is kind of weird too. Every single door was locked. Every single window was closed. There were two windows that didn't have curtains and those were, were actually blocked with the Moore's clothing. So whoever killed them actually covered the windows. windows with their clothes, yeah. So it's really weird, like, how do you go through the home and murder eight people without anyone else waking up? Yeah, that's really... With multiple people in each room. Right. Weird, right? Mm, unless they were, like, drugged or something. Yeah, that's a good point. I didn't think of that. So the axe that they found, actually, on the floor, um, it appeared that they did attempt to wipe the blood off of it. You could see, like, the, they say on the axe, you could see that he wiped it off, but then he left the axe in the bedroom on the floor. So another weird thing was in the kitchen, they found a pan full of bloody water in the sink. And then on the table, there was a plate with food on it, but it hadn't been eaten. So it was almost like this person came in and they somehow organized an eight person murder without anyone waking up, attempted to clean up a little, at least they washed their hands in the sink and then made some food, but didn't eat it. You know what? I feel like they were drugged. Maybe he was a guest. He came over for dinner. Everybody else ate. He didn't eat his food. They all passed out. He dragged them to their beds. That's a really there. good point. And then lastly, in the, the parents' bedroom, so Josiah and Sarah's room, there were actually gouges all in the ceiling. I'm, a, I'm picturing like a really low ceiling like the old houses back then. Yeah. Gouges all in the ceiling from the upward swing of the axe. Mm, so someone... He was like standing over them. Ish. Yeah, and there was a shoe next to the bed, so where one of the bodies was kind of like right at the edge of the bed, and blood had dripped down, and there was a shoe next to the bed that had blood inside of it, like if you were to look in through the top of the shoe, mm. but that the shoe was tipped over, and it was also on the side of the shoe dripping off of the bed. So they think that he went in, killed them initially, the blood had poured in the shoe and that he actually went back and and actually kind of went at it again mm. and hit the shoe and the shoe tipped over because there was a lot of blood inside. But then it was tipped over and away. So there's a lot of blood on the side of it too. Mm -hmm. So really strange. All right, let's talk suspects here, okay? Our first suspect is Frank Jones. So he was actually a local resident as well, but he also was a senator in Iowa. Josiah, the father, actually worked for him for a long time in his own personal store until he went on to open his own store 
which became very successful. Mm. So that could have been like kind of a, a rivalry thing. And then it was also rumored that Josiah had an affair with Frank Jones's daughter-in-law. So a little oh. personal thing there too. Yeah. So he's our first suspect. Our second suspect, William Mansfield. So he was accused by the, uh, the detective agency that was working the case. Detective Wilkerson was convinced that this man um, was the murderer. He supposedly was a cocaine fiend and a serial killer. Wilkerson believed that he was responsible for an axe murder that occurred four days before the Moore murders took place. And the murders actually had a lot of similarities. In both cases, there was an axe as the murder weapon and other similarities. So he was convinced it was this guy and it took him until 1916 and he finally convinced a grand jury to open a case against Mansfield. And he said that he could put him in the town at the time of the murder. William Mansfield was actually from Illinois and come to find out he actually had time cards from that exact night that puts him in Illinois. Mm. So he actually walked away and then a few years later he sued Detective Wilkerson and he won $2,225. Which, which in was... 1916 when this all went down was a lot of money. Mm. So our third suspect is Reverend George Kelly. So he is a traveling reverend and he was actually at the children's event at the church that night. So he was involved with the Moors, the Moor children, the Stillinger girls. He was participating in the event and he ended up leaving town super early that next morning, which just made him look so much more guilty. Yeah. So much to the point that they ended up arresting him. After they arrested him, they questioned him like really hard and they ended up getting a confession out of him. But supposedly this confession was made under extreme duress and he was just an absolute mess to the point that they ended up tossing his confession. So when Reverend George Kelly finally went to trial, he ended up being acquitted by a hung jury. So he got really lucky there. Mm. The last suspect that we're gonna talk about, there were many other ones, but we're only gonna mention just a few of the main ones. His name was Henry Moore, so no relation to the Moore family. Henry Moore lived with his mother and his grandmother in Missouri. However, in the summer of 1912, he supposedly left the area to work on the railroad. So he didn't actually live with them at the time and he wasn't accounted for the summer of 1912 when the Moore murders happened. So around this time, there were actually 22 other cases across the Midwest that were the similar. People just getting brutally murdered with an ax. So a lot of coincidences there. And supposedly he was tied to a lot of them, but he finally got um, arrested and convicted when he murdered his own mother and grandmother, killed them both with an ax. So Henry Moore ended up serving 36 years and then he was finally up for parole and he ended up being released from prison. He was like 86, I believe he was. And, uh, Nobody has, nobody knows like what happened to him after, but he's like a whole nother story because he's a serial killer. <laughs> Supposedly, yeah. allegedly a serial killer. Yeah. So now that we've gone over our short list of suspects, I'm going to eat a little bit more. And then we're going to talk about the Axe Murder House today. My belly is full. Let's wrap up the story. So even though they had a rather large list of potential suspects, they never were able to actually pin anyone down. So no one was ever arrested. And the mystery of who the murderer was actually still remains between the walls of the ax murder house today. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what's going on with this little home in Villisca, Iowa. 
1994, Darwin and Martha Lynn of Iowa actually purchased the Axe Murder House. And do you want to know what they did? <laughs> they ended up taking the entire home because of course it got it was modernized through the years but when they purchased it they renovated it to go back to 1912 at the time of the murders so they removed all of the plumbing they removed all of the electricity they put an outhouse back out behind the home like there was one back then they put the barn back because they had horses back then and he, they even went to the uh, to the extent where they bought furniture that was actually true to the time and they set up the home the way it was set up when the Moors lived there. He even found, Darwin even found a calendar from 1912 and he flipped it to the month of June wow. and hung it in the kitchen. He was trying to make it like a... Like exactly like they left yeah, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When they were completed with the renovation, they did actually open it up sort of like an inn. So they do have it open and available to the public for tours, or you can pay $428 and stay the night. Like, it's like the Lizzie Borden house. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so, of course, a ton of people who are into, like, murder mysteries and stuff, you know, will go and visit or at least do a tour but mostly like ghost hunters and paranormal investigators that would go and pay the money to stay the night. And they actually have audio, video, and photographic proof of spirits in the home too. So through the years, um, earlier on, there were a ton of psychics that have gone through there and have all confirmed that there are definitely spirits in the home. A couple of them have communicated with the spirits. And then there's also many different accounts where there was a tour going on and they were cut short because people were so terrified from um, children's voices. That's like something that happens a lot. Um, there's also sounds of like objects moving, like you can hear something sliding in a different part of the house. And it's quiet, there's like nothing running in the home, there's no electricity, right? Then also like lamps moving and objects moving on their own. So those kerosene lamps too, that was like another thing that okay. was like, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have one more story within a story real quick to tell you. In November of 2014, there was a ghost hunter who visited the Axe Murder House and he paid the money to stay the night. And in the middle of the night, he actually stabbed himself in the chest with a knife and had to be rushed to the emergency room. And he ended up living. Why? There was no reason for it at all. So what's so cool is it was a mystery for a long time. And then the, there's a caretaker, his name is Johnny Hauser. He's the caretaker of the home. And he was working at the house one day when a group of um, ghost hunters for, there's a show called Kindred Spirits. It's like one of those ghost hunter shows. And there was, so there was a group of them that were gonna be staying, uh, staying the night and they were gonna be filming at the Axe Murder House. Mm -hmm. And Johnny, the caretaker, he was outside and he noticed one of the guys and he was like, oh my God, it's you. You were the guy who stabbed yourself because he was the one who had to go back and clean up this man's blood after uh. he stabbed himself in the chest. Monza. No, no, no. So anyway, he's like, you know, I got to ask you, like, what happened that night? And he said honestly i was in there it was the middle of the night it was dark and he's like i was kind of yelling at the spirits he was like provoking them to try and get them to communicate and he said and then i don't remember anything else just waking up in the hospital i had no idea what i had done to myself That's he weird. had no clue yeah he was possessed. yeah something weird took over for sure johnny took the ghost hunters from kindred spirits and he brought them back into the home and was doing the tour with them and as soon as they walked in i guess the the man who stabbed himself like immediately started talking to the spirits and he was like i'm so sorry and he was like really upset and torn about it and i guess the whole experience he said ruined his life because he like people thought he was crazy they thought he was doing it for publicity mm -hmm. so he he ended up on this show so he could tell his side of the story and like you know share that something took over him he had no idea what happened didn't do it on purpose didn't do it for attention right. um but yeah something scary and ever since that incident in 2014 even the johnny hauser the caretaker refuses to stay at the home well yeah 
Thank you everyone for joining me. I highly recommend that you search the Axe Murder House and actually go to their official website. You can read everything I told you, but in further detail, and it's really interesting and very fascinating. Uh, but I thank you for being here. We are gonna wrap this up with a little bit of dessert. I'm gonna eat my red bean bang, red bean bread. And um, while I eat this, you should like this video and then subscribe so you can come join us next week. Bye.